So let's go to the, <clears throat> to the next session. And uh, Robert Gall is going to present his paper on the uh, transfer cost of parenthood. Robert, it's yours. Good morning, good day, and good evening to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, Robert Gunn speaking uh, on a pre-recorded uh, uh, presentation. Uh, on behalf of uh, my collaborators, Marton and Peter, uh, who worked with me on this paper, uh, which is about the transfer cost of parenthood, we will split NTA uh, between parents and non-parents. Uh, we will compare the transfer burdens uh, of parents and non-parents in their working age. Uh, uh, at the end of the comparison, we find a major asymmetry between the two groups, and we argue that the results are consistent with the frequently demonstrated small fertility effects of social policy. If behavioral effects are limited, redistribution uh, can be or will be large. Finally, we provide some policy conclusions. We start with uh, where uh, NTA and NTTA uh, uh, currently uh, stays. Um, uh, this is the per capita age profiles of net public and familial transfers. Uh, we could do the analysis for 14 European countries. Um, which uh, between them uh, represent 70% uh, of the population of the European Union and also represent all uh, four major uh, types of uh, uh, welfare regimes or welfare state institutions. Um, we can see, uh, well, uh, you still have um, the, the pair of curves up here, that public transfers clearly distinguish between three overlapping age groups. Um, children, uh, people in working age, and uh, older people. Uh, in contrast, familial transfers appear to be almost exclusively two-generational. Uh, people uh, in parental age, uh, in working age, give to children uh, whereas the balance of all the people converges to zero. In effect, older age groups are absent from the inter-age familial uh, transfer mechanism. Uh, this macro level analysis makes a strong case, uh, suggesting that familial transfers are fully parental transfers without the part participation of non-parents. However, a strong case strong as it may be, is not an evidence. Many working age transfers may come from non-parents still. Uh, so the parents and non-parents have to be separated at the micro level. For that, we have to find out who a parent is. In the everyday use of the word, parenthood refers to an irreversible status. Once a parent, always a parent. However, child raising is just a section of the life cycle. Parenthood never ends, but the period of supporting children, that is the period of uh, giving transfers uh, to your children does. Uh, this is in line with the definition of parenthood in the surveys that we use here. Neither uh, the income and living condition survey of the EU, nor the household budget surveys, nor the European have uh, interview study include information on completed fertility. Consequently, the parenthood is represented by parents who happen to cohabit with children in the base year. There are consequences uh, for the separation uh, uh, because of this cohabitation based parenthood definition. Uh, not on public transfers. Uh, public transfers can, uh, uh, can easily split uh, by parenthood status. Even the most critical issue, child-related benefits, uh, can be easily split because they are always paid to uh, cohabiting parents in case of divorced or uh, split parents. However, there are consequences for familial transfers. 
uh, going by this definition, divorced parents and non-cohabiting old parents, uh, old grandparents sometimes, are not parents. They can provide only inter-household transfers. Uh, in contrast, foster parents, stepfathers, stepmothers, are parents as long as they uh, choose to be one. Uh, the parenthood definition is based on the household roster uh, of the surveys where uh, the respondents uh, decide about the definition of their internal relationships. Uh, the other consequence is that parenthood is age related. Uh, its frequency first grows and then decreases by age. Uh, as children uh, are born one after the other, uh, and then either parents divorce and, uh, or split, uh, or children grow up and move out. So beyond working age, uh, there are only small selected minorities co-residing with their children. Uh, uh, the cell frequencies in the sample suddenly drop at around the age uh, when working age ad, uh, ends, uh, and the selected minorities are uh, either typically older uh, men establishing a second family, uh, or uh, on the other edge of uh, uh, the income scale, um, poorer families uh, co-residing with, uh, uh, with uh, grandparents, where again, um, uh, the household roster would define a parenthood definition, uh, a parenthood uh, relationship. Since we cannot distinguish between parental and non-parental inter-household transfers, since um, uh, uh, our surveys record only the amount uh, and the existence of uh, inter-household transfers received or given, but we know nothing uh, about the sender or the beneficiary of uh, such transfers, uh, we, in, uh, we exclude the inter-household transfers. Uh, from the analysis, uh, just to be uh, on the conservative side. Uh, we believe that the majority of uh, uh, these transfers excluded this way uh, are still parental transfers, but we, we don't know that for sure. Uh, also, co-residing parents beyond working age are excluded, so we limit uh, our comparison of parents and non-parents to the working age or to the age of net uh, uh, contributors uh, to the uh, uh, to the interage um, transfer system, uh, and finally, the intra-household transfers have to be split between parents and non-parents living in households with resident uh, uh, children, uh, because otherwise, um, uh, a certain amount of uh, intra-household transfers uh, would be assigned to parents even if uh, uh, they come from uh, uh, cohabiting uh, uh, non-parents like other relatives, uh, uh, grown-up siblings of uh, uh, dependent children or, or even non-relatives uh, uh, non living in the house. Now this is what we get, this is still ag aggregate level analysis. Um, here uh, you see the age profiles of fa familial transfers by type, cash or time, so this is NTA and this is NTTA, uh, and household boundary, boundary whether they are intra-household or inter-household, and you, uh, you can see that in both cases inter-household transfers are just marginal, so getting rid of them in the analysis um, change practically nothing. And this is uh, the result of our, um, uh, of our micro level uh, analysis. Here you can see uh, the public and the intra-household familial transfers by parenthood status in working age. And what you find is that despite some dissimilarities uh, in uh, uh, or between parents and non-parents uh, in uh, uh, terms of uh, uh, net public transfers uh, given, overall 
they are not that much different. Uh, they have um, uh, the, the lowest point at different age, so the, the age structure uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, is different, but it's not that uh, uh, non-parents give a lot of public transfers, whereas parents do not. They more or less give the same amount, possibly, as we will see, um, non-parents give somewhat more. The major difference is here. So the micro um, level analysis, uh, the household level splitting of, uh, um, uh, or within a household splitting of uh, parents and non-parents, uh, do not really affect the results. Um, non-parental familial uh, transfers are practically zero. Um, it's because most non-parents uh, live in households uh, without uh, a resident child. So obviously they give uh, private transfers, they receive private transfers, but they, they do not give inter-age uh, uh, private transfers or familial transfers. In contrast, parents uh, do uh, give a lot of uh, um, net transfers um, uh, within within their households. So the micro level analysis confirms that uh, familial transfers are mostly parental uh, transfers. Um, these kind of period age profiles are frequently used to estimate uh, stocks that are generated over time. Uh, we do the same here. Uh, by comparing stylized <coughs> uh, active ages or working ages of parents and non-parents. Uh, and uh, in this way, uh, we will measure the transfer cost of parenthood. Uh, the assumptions are very simple. First, uh, as I mentioned, uh, our period age profiles will stand for life cycle profiles, and they will be adjusted by growth, uh, mortality, and uh, uh, discount rate. This is what we get by country. So this is the value of the transfer package um, separately for uh, non-parents and parents and by type familial or public and total. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, prime earning age labor income, that is, um, uh, uh, years of labor income by the average uh, 30, 49 uh, year old uh, person, uh, as it is usually in, in, in NTA analysis. And uh, well, this table actually includes uh, quite a few very interesting details, which uh, uh, we briefly mentioned in the paper. But here I would uh, uh, point to the aggregate uh, results that parents. Uh, provide um, these synthetic parents provide uh, nearly 15 years uh, worth of um, uh, labor income of uh, prime earning age uh, uh, workers uh, against uh, um, somewhat below eight uh, years uh, of labor income uh, by non-parents. So this is this is a major difference, and it is uh, exclusively due to the difference in familial transfers. Um, non-parents, on average, uh, on European or uh, EU14 average, uh, uh, contribute practically nothing in uh, in terms of net familial uh, transfers, and uh, parents. Uh, contribute a, lo uh, a lot uh, to this interage transfer system. Um, this is something that is not accounted for in the current uh, standard of national accounts. Neither, uh, uh, neither is it uh, uh, recognized and accepted uh, by uh, eligibility rules. So this is a major part of the inter transfer system, uh, which uh, became visible in the academic sector, but which is still invisible 
uh, for public statistics. Um, so overall, um, the total parental transfer package uh, to the total non-parental transfer package is almost twice as big, 1.9. And the variation, these are the extremes, Hungary and Denmark. Uh, uh, the variation is not, is not that much. So uh, the co coefficient of variation uh, for this vector is, is really small. So this is a typical uh, 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 pattern uh, irrespective or mostly irrespective uh, of uh, uh, whether a country has a Nordic or a continental or an, uh, an Anglo-Saxon or a Mediterranean or an East European or any uh, uh, other type of uh, welfare regime. Um, we could consider this excess transfer burden on parents as a tax on child raising. Um, social policies such as child-related benefits or pensions are frequently shown to affect fertility. And also such effects are usually found to be weak, so that uh, uh, people respond uh, or fertility respond positively uh, to uh, increases in child-related benefits uh, and negatively uh, to the maturation process uh, of a pay-as-you-go pension system. Uh, but still, these effects are usually rather limited. Uh, we argue in the paper that the very reason which such effects are weak for uh, is a driver of extensive redistribution. See, uh, we believe that uh, uh, by demonstrating this difference uh, between a parental and non-parental transfer packages, uh, we found the other side of the coin. Uh, for that, we apply a conceptual framework borrowed from the microeconomics of taxation uh, to capture two effects at once, the fertility response and the redistribution by um, effects of social policies depend on price elasticities. If demand for children is elastic with respect to the net cost of child raising, the fertility response uh, will be strong and taxes collected and the resulting redistribution by parental status will be small. If demand is inelastic, that is the fertility effect of these uh, kind of uh, policies are limited, then uh, uh, the redistribution from parents to non-parents uh, uh, will be strong and uh, massive amounts of taxes will be collected from parents. In other words, the very fact that fertility responses to taxing children are small implies that the redistributive effect. So just uh, coming to the conclusions, the overall transfer burden was found uh, to be almost twice as large on parents uh, than on non-parents in today's Europe. This asymmetry is not reflected in the eligibility rules of public pension uh, or health healthcare systems. Uh, such circumstances create the conditions uh, for redistribution between parental and non-parental life cycles. The frequently observed small magnitude of fertility effects of social policy may well go hand in hand with large scale. Now, taxing price inelastic activities minimize the dead weight loss. So if demand for children is inelastic, it would be efficient to tax child raising. So uh, in the end, it is society's choice to what extent it actually wants to see child raising being taxed. Um, since the parenthood status changes over the life cycle, um, the policy conclusions uh, that are derived have to be carefully chosen. Uh, after all, this paper compared synthetic parents with synthetic non-parents, not actual parents with actual non-parents. Yet, if society decides uh, to limit uh, this taxation, then one reasonable way to internalize the net benefits 
could be cash or in-kind compensatory policies such as child benefits, child care, public education, but also child-related pensions. However, these policies ought not to be seen as pro-natalist, but rather as compensatory. A compensation of current anti-natalist policies taxing the activity of child raising. So the question is not whether pro-natalist policies are effective, but whether they are pro-natalist. Thank you for your attention, and you can find our paper here. Yeah, I just wanted to mention two two quick points. One was that um, so in our study of uh, the this data for the U.S., I think we find something similar on as far as the the total overall impact. We get like one point four. Uh, you're showing one point nine for uh, Europe overall, but you have one point four for or one point five for uh, Hungary. So we're kind of close in there for the U.S. data. But one interesting uh, difference is on the relative weight given to public transfer versus familial transfer. So the US looks a little bit out of line uh, with um, your averages for Europe. And I think that may just be because the Europe, is, uh, the US is just uh, odd, it's just different. Um, so that's just one point to raise. And then the second kind of question I had was on your slide of the uh, profiles by uh, age uh, and how those are influenced by your discounting rate. So it seems like a higher discount rate is going to weight more the family transfers as opposed to the public transfers since those family transfers occur earlier in the life cycle. So you tend to see uh, there, there might be some influence on the relative weights, so giving you that 1.9 uh, number. So I'll just pause there and turn it back over to Luis then. Yeah, well, thank you, Tim. Okay, Luis, you're on. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. I can. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a few points about this, uh, this important, important paper. The first one is... Uh, the, 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 the choice or, of the definition of parenthood, which is uh, based on coincidence. I don't know if you choose that because you want to or, or because you were, you were forced to because uh, the data available is just for that definition. And uh, what uh, or how do you think your results would change using the natural definition of, of parenthood in mean, the biological definition. Uh, that's, that's my first point. My uh, second point, uh, it has to do with the fact that uh, many times the, 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 the aids from the, from the government to families, to families with children, go directly to children in the form of, of education or other, other types of, of AIDS. And uh, you cannot include this type of uh, assistance from the government, transfer from the government in, in your approach and in, you, in general in the MTA approach. So again, how do you think this uh, affect some of, of, of your conclusions. And finally, uh, why do you think that uh, in Hungary, uh, the, the transfers that non-parents pay is so high? Is that for design or because there are some policies in place for making non-parents to pay more in taxation, for instance. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to James uh, Sefton. Hi, hi. Well, I, first, the um, president, thank you very much, Robert. Um, it was like going to a concert where, the, the, where the, there's a voiceover. Um, the pre recorded was quite an experience. I've not had that in Zoom yet. I'm going to copy you. It's a very useful trick. Um, just some two got first on the paper and then the thoughts about uh, some thoughts about social justice. So on the papers, we had this in Bernard's paper as well. 
when we're looking at these familial tra uh, family transfers, private transfers. And the absence of these bequests or the NTA thing that we don't look at bequests, these transfers. And so you've got the old as being your know, net zero contributors. I mean, that's very much you know, driven by the fact that we don't look at these capital transfers. So it's a general point about NTA. And then another one about transitions. So when you're calculating your stocks, I think you must be assuming that when uh, uh, a, a parent household, when the children leave a parent household, they become identical to a non-parent household. Uh, you can't tell them the difference. But there seems to be an issue there when you're trying to calculate stocks, that once the children have left, these two, these two households are not necessarily going to be the same for the remaining part of their life. They're going to be very much influenced by what's happened before. And so you've got to be careful when you calculate these stocks, you roll them forward, project forward, uh, that you don't sort of, um, you go, don't, uh, yeah, and mix the effects for the older, sort of the 50 year to 60 year old households. I really love, I thought you could push the paper a bit harder in terms of offering breakdowns between the cash and the non-cash. I thought that, having done that analysis, I thought that was really interesting. And thinking about, you know, how much of the transfers are done in the market and non-market. And then I thought, and by gender as well, I didn't understand why you didn't so do to the decompositions by gender as well. I thought that would be very interesting to see the split there. And then I could thought, to answer your question about pronatal policies, I thought you could then do a comparison across countries, looking at countries that have a very pro-child policy, uh, such as Sweden, and comparing to countries like the UK, which doesn't have a particularly strong pro-child, to see if there's any difference in the trans compensating impact amongst the uh, family transfers that compensate for the fact that they're not getting it through the public uh, sector. Um, so I thought that you could really push the results there and come up with some interesting, uh, further interesting conclusions. In terms of your general push on social justice, the idea that having children was some sort of tax burden. I think you've got to, I've got to push back a little bit on that one. Um, I mean, you've got to see children also as a choice and almost, a, as, you know, as a consumption good. And then in order to be able to look at those questions of social justice, you've got to think about the private returns to having children as compared to the public returns to having children. And here, you know, you cite Ron's earlier paper, but that's an excellent sort of discussion of the difference between, you know, uh, centralized choice of what the fertility rate should be versus the private choice of what per, uh, fertility rate should be. And the difference between those is due to these externalities that are not measured at the private level, but happen at the public level. I mean, you do cite this work. Um, and it's, you know, where these externalities are, are when there's a finite resource, there's debt that could be shared, the first, the former being a negative, the second one being a positive, defence again can be shared, uh, and then all the transfer programmes, and then climate change, the impact on the climate of, of having children, which is becoming very, very topical. Um, and I do think in some ways the science paper, by the NTA science paper, did address exactly this issue, so you could draw on that, where they have internalized some of these externalities, certainly the transfer programs, certainly the debt, public debt, in arguing what is the optimal centralized fertility rate, uh, desired to optimize consumption. You could then compare that to the actual fertility rate and argue whether they are different and there is a need for some sort of pronatal or, you know, antenatal policy. But thank you very much. Thank you. Those are my comments. Yeah. Um, so a uh, very useful analysis. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. I'm being brief. Uh, Tim's uh, comments, uh, he covered himself. 
So it seems like there's kind of three areas where there are uh, very interesting issues for this meeting. There's the distributional analysis. So um, here, the emphasis is on parents versus non-parents. And there's a different different ways you can slice this, it seems to me. So um, Louise mentioned that you could use a biological definition of parents versus non-parents. But also a way is to you, you know, you could use just an economic definition of a parent versus a non-parent. I mean, once my kids left home and stopped getting anything from me, uh, they didn't consider me a parent anymore. Uh, so we could just take our transfers, our inter house intra household transfers, and use that to partition our sample into uh, uh, people who are getting, uh, who are giving transfers to downward to children or grandchildren and people who are not. And I think in a way that's very similar to the analysis that's being done using living arrangements, but I would, uh, I would like to see how it would compare. So the longitudinal analysis is uh, potentially very interesting. Uh, as always, we fall back on uh, stylized longitudinal analysis. Uh, we are starting to have more limited time series data, so it would be helpful to see what that's like. And then finally, there's the issue of inter-age transfer. So we want to know which age groups are transferring to children. Uh, public. I guess I want to know more about whether taxes on workers are being imposed on seniors. No, whether taxes to workers are being to seniors, benefits to seniors flow from taxes on workers, while benefits for children flow more for from seniors. In the United States, we use property tax to fund education, uh, but we use earnings taxes to fund uh, health care and, and uh, Social Security. Uh, so, uh, and then finally, uh, private transfers. I haven't, I thought I would hear discussion about the inflow outflow matrix. Uh, and I know Luis was going to talk about this, but decided not to. But let me just mention that we do have the possibility of constructing uh, private uh, intra-household transfers by the age of the provider and the age of the recipient. And so we can uh, really identify who is making transfers to children and who is not. Uh, and so the people who are uh, here, we see this is a uh, uh, parents making transfers to children are identified here. These are the total values, but we could partition the uh, survey using the people who are making some transfers and those who are making none at all. And then we have uh, intergenerational transfers to spouses, and maybe there's a little bit to older adults that we see in India, hard to say. But it seems to me we can make better use of these data to address the kind of issues that are being raised in uh, the paper by Robert Gall and his colleagues. Uh, so I will turn over uh, my responsibilities both as a discussant and as a moderator to our next moderator. Uh, and that is... David, are you the next moderator? David? I believe I am. Okay. Okay, so I, I'm, I understand there's been a change of order in this session. Um, and so I'd like to welcome Hippolyte to speak. So he's going to have 20 minutes and then each discussant will have five as before. Okay, thank you, David. Um, hello, hi, uh, everyone. Let me see. Uh, it's okay. Okay, can you see it? 
It's fine. Okay. Uh, so thank you for the organizer. Uh, to, uh, thank you to the organizer for organizing uh, organizing this meeting. Uh, it's very early for me, but uh, but uh, this will be fine. Huh? I hope you will be able to uh, to follow me. So I'm going to present a paper with uh, Ipkidi Baji, um, which is about uh, income inequality and uh, the novelty here is that we are going to consider intra cohort uh, income inequalities. Um, so it's um, it's Ippolit. part of a project of uh, Ippolit, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt. But on, my, on my screen, your your uh, screen sharing, I can only see about eighty percent of your slides. So they seem to be cut off on the sides and cut off at the top. I don't know if anyone else has the same issue. It better if I do something. It's fine like that. Now we see the top left corner. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. Is is anyone else having the same problem? Or I don't think we have the same problem. I see everything fine. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Sorry about that. Emily. So I should go. Uh, um, sorry about that, huh, because it's. Uh, is it? Sorry, Hippolyte, it's fine. I think it's okay. It was. It was something on. Ah, my it's mind. fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, no, it's fine. Uh, so, um, so it's about, uh, you know, we are looking at those distributional issues with the French uh, NTA, and we have done already in the past uh, something about consumption and income of the less educated. And now we fo focus on uh, income inequalities. So, uh, uh, as a short teaser, I could say that in macro, it's well established that GDP or income, if you wish, is not a, a perfect indicator, you know, of welfare. So uh, it's um, well established that we should uh, take into account like uh, inequalities. And uh, if I may mention, for instance, uh, Flaubert and Gaulier or John Sagranclino, you know, they rebuild some uh, welfare indicator of uh, the nations according to both income and inequality. Um, but uh, in uh, microeconomic, it's more, a bit more complicated. We don't know what should be a, a relevant sample, you know, for measuring inequalities. Here we are going to have uh, uh, one assumption that will be that it's uh, the inequality within your age group that matter. In short, is that uh, uh, more likely to be uh, affected within your age group. Huh? You suffer if uh, those uh, fellows of the same age uh, are um, richer than you. Um, and this inequality is, uh, in short, more important, you know, than, than uh, intergenerational inequality, if you wish. So the objective of this paper is to use uh, this uh, micro NTA data, if you wish, uh, to compute those inequalities and estimate how do they um, uh, evolve over the life cycle and across courts. So I'm going to use two, uh, two kinds of variables. I'm going to use an annual survey, you know, that range from uh, 96 to 2000. I will get some uh, annual data and annual computation. For I'm going to compute it for two uh, kinds of uh, variables. First is uh, gross income, and the second one is uh, disposable income. So disposable income is your income after tax. Easy, you, know, you get it uh, directly from the survey. And uh, for gross income, you know, we had to do um, a lot of uh, recalculation in order to compute basically the social contribution of, um, of, uh, of each uh, household. Um, so the advantage of having those two uh, variables is that uh, you could see the impact of, let's say, uh, what I'm going to call the social, uh, the, the social, um, the socio-fiscal uh, uh, system in France. Uh, so those surveys are very good. Huh? It's not the one that uh, uh, we were using previously uh, to compute the, the French entity. 
they are very good in order to compute incomes. We are going to restrict uh, to a uh, household whose age run from uh, 25 to uh, um, okay, so let me uh, show you how we could present data. So the first way is borrowed from uh, uh, Fisher, uh, Teams Meeting, and some co-authors, uh, which I, I feel quite uh, quite nice. So the, the idea is that you take the whole sample, you divide it in a quantile, if you wish, and then you compute the threshold um, income um, for each quantile. And then you define some age group. So here I've uh, defined a four age group, uh, the 30 uh, and the less than 30 year old, the 30, uh, 49, the 50, 64, and the 65 plus. And then you compute the share of each age group that belong to each quantile. Okay, so you see here in, uh, in light blue uh, quantile uh, one, uh, which is uh, the, the poorest quantile, till uh, dark blue, which is uh, quantile five, uh, the, the richest one. So for instance, in 96, uh, you see that uh, uh, among the young, uh, the youngest, uh, those who are uh, 30 and less, uh, um, that 30% uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of of the age group uh, belongs to the first quantile, whereas only 6% belongs to the, um, the highest quantile. Okay, and if you compare to the 65 plus, for instance, it's the opposite. Uh, the proportion of those who are in the highest quantile is larger um, than, uh, than 20%, which would be the average, uh, such that uh, there is no age effect. Okay, so first, uh, what we, we learn is that there is a strong age effect, you know, in uh, inequalities, uh, and uh, that, um, that, um, that, um, that in short, uh, basically, uh, um, uh, the youngest suffer, you know, from, from more inequalities than the, 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 the middle age. And, um, okay. and if you compare, you know, the two, uh, the two graphs here, uh, those uh, in 96 and uh, the one in 2014, you will see that the inequality, you know, within age group has increased. If you take the youngest, for instance, uh, you will see that it's more than 30%, it's something like 32% who now belongs to the first quantile. So this is for gross income, uh, the before redistribution, if you will. And this one is after redistribution. And uh, we could see that uh, basically uh, the redistribution in France uh, reduce the, those inequality uh, among age group and between age group. Um, another way to present basically our data is to compute Gini. Uh, the Gini coefficient by age group. So here uh, you have a um, five-year age group uh, uh, starting uh, from uh, 20, uh, 25 to 29, 80 to uh, 80. You could compute the Gini, you know, each uh, age group. So we did it for gross income and for disposable income. And, um, and, uh, and here I do represent two um, two dates, uh, the, 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 the Gini in uh, 96 and the Gini in 2014. So um, what, could do, uh, what do we get from that? Uh, first, uh, of course, the Gini is higher um, for gross income than for disposable income. Uh, this is very clear. Second, the Gini is a U-shape function of age. I'm going to come back on that, you know, it's very important. So there are more inequality in, your, in the middle of life, if you wish, than, uh, than when you are young or old. And uh, there is like an increase in inequality, you know, over the period, uh, notably for the oldest age. So you could compute also the, the Tyler ratio, huh? of uh, uh, top income group uh, and you see here that uh, um, at least for gross income uh, we see that uh, there is a lot of inequality and there is a lot of and that uh, this uh, this inequality is decreasing over age uh, 
if you uh, look at disposable income, uh, actually this initial inequality that was um, seen, you know, for gross income is not, uh, is not here anymore. Uh, so, uh, so we see immediately that uh, um, the, the, the redistribution in France uh, is reducing a lot uh, inequality measured by the decil ratio among the young, uh, the young people. Hein, basically, you have a hand-shaped uh, distribution. Uh, it seems uh, to uh, be very large, uh, you know, at uh, the socio-fiscal uh, socio system. But of course, uh, um, so even though we have like a longitudinal data, is that there is some cohort of player effects, sorry, that play. Need to control for that, so we have done a, a little bit of econometrics huh? uh, in order to, uh, to estimate uh, the age cohort, uh, cohort and period effect. So this is a genie as a function of the age group once you control for the uh, the cohort and period effect. So, so still you see uh, that uh, for gross income that there is still this hem shape function. And very uh, visible and very clear over the life cycle. Uh, this robust of having, you know, a higher inequality uh, at five uh, is very strong. Um, Sorry, as for disposable income, you know, so after redistribution, it's a bit less uh, visible. Okay? Uh, and basically, uh, you, you see an increase, you know, in inequality over the life cycle. And then it's, uh, it's more or less plateauing. Uh, if you take the decile, uh, decile uh, uh, ratio, it's, uh, it's not at all the same, you know, because you have a strong decline in inequality. So um, this, uh, this uh, hem shape, you know, is very robust. Huh? We have tested it for uh, uh, other variables with uh, other survey data. And here, for instance, uh, it's uh, using uh, consumption data. And, uh, we still have this uh, including uh, imputed rent. So now um, I'm, I'm computing basically the evolution of this inequality as a function of the cohort. And uh, I found this um, very striking because uh, um, actually, you, you, you know that uh, in, uh, in France, uh, we do not uh, observe uh, an increase in equality in general. But if you look at this inequality across court, uh, you observe an increase in inequality. Okay? So this very specific inequality, which is the intra cohort inequality, if you regress it as a function of the birth date, um, you observe an increase in inequality, it's what I've presented. So it's true for gross income, and it's also true for disposable income. Uh, basically, the level of inequality of a younger cohort, uh, let's say those who were born in the 80s, is significantly larger than the level of inequality um, experience, you know, by uh, those who were born in, uh, in the 40s, for instance. Uh, if you look at the um, uh, still, uh, uh, for gross income, we do observe a strong increase in inequality. But here, the redistribution, you know, of the, the French system has a strong impact. And uh, so once, once we look at a disposable income, uh, basically, we do, not we do not find any change in inequality across cohort. Um, um, uh, we do not find any significant increase. So uh, we can conclude that the, the, the redistribution um, is uh, quite effective, you know, for the extreme of the distribution, you know, basically uh, on the design ratio, whereas uh, it was not so effective, you know, on um, on, uh, on, uh, it was not so effective on, uh, on the Gini coefficient. Uh, so, um, so briefly, uh, it was what uh, done, you know, with uh, yeah, 
clear. Huh? So there is a clear we obtain that there is a clear increase. Uh, sorry, there is a clear increase in inequality across the socio-fiscal system. Uh, clearly reduce inequality when it's uh, measured. Now um, we are thinking about, you know, computing uh, like a composite indicator that could include uh, both income and the inequality in order to have an evaluation of the welfare, you know, of each generation and see whether, you know, this uh, welfare has increased or not across cohorts. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Hippolyte. Um, uh, so the first discussion is is Ivan. Ivan. Yes. Uh, hi. Um, thank you so much, Hippolyte. It, this is a very interesting paper, and uh, it's it's great to see these differences in the in the social or fiscal system that you have in France. Um, just have a few comments like <clears throat> uh, the first one is about the difference between gross and disposable income particularly for those age uh, 65 and older like uh, for example uh, these people I, I imagine they don't do some social contribution rates um, and the difference uh, and, and 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 for the disposable income it's, it should be net of income taxes. So what is exactly the difference in terms like within the NTA context? Like I imagine you are for this age group just measuring the asset income and public transfers, I guess. Um, <clears throat> the second is um, uh, this difference in age group. Uh, you, you show in one slide the this negative gra gradient in the quintiles for age, ages 30 to 49. So it's a declining, right, uh, gradient, but it's a positive gradient for ages 50 to 64. So uh, what is exactly the, the difference is because pe younger people earn less money than, than people in ages 50 to 64, or, or what is exactly what is happening there like it's a compositional effect or what is what is that it's, and <clears throat> the other comment is about that about the pseudo cohort estimation so uh, we know this APC linear dependency right like uh, we still th there's still no agreement about how to measure APC effects and I remember this paper from 2013 from Jan Jan. They, they introduced a new technique to measure APC effects using a, a multi level approach. Um, so, uh, my point is, uh, is perhaps it will be useful to do some se sensitivity analysis because depending on the method that you use, using fixed effects or random effects, you might get some, some differences. Um, uh, and and the, the, the last comment is about uh, the different results depending on the inequality measure that you use. You, like I, I see in, in, in one plot some difference using the Gini and, and other using the ratio of the, of the quantiles. So uh, I think perhaps just doing a comparison or, or just maybe just a different it's just a different interpretation when you use different uh, measures and uh, well uh, last one is about policy implication like uh, imagine that this what you are seeing these differences across cohorts like so and you see this increase in equality among uh, uh, people uh, uh, on working ages so what, what is the implication um, that's that's all for me. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Ivan. Um, Hippolyte, if it's okay, I think we'll just go through all the the uh, discussants, and then you can deal with the questions at the end. Um, so Sonia is going to uh, talk to us next. Yeah, thanks a lot, Hippolyte, for the presentation. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I have three points um, that I want to comment on, and then a, a question out of personal interest. So first, I'd be curious if you had a look at the role of education and employment 
to explain your results because I'm wondering if some of the increase in inequality is simply because some of your youngest age group are still in education in a uh, later time and some of your older age group are still in employment at your later point in time. And uh, what will be interesting in this context is actually a decomposition that Bernhard Hammer just started where he's also looking at income changes over time and decomposes them into an employment effect and a uh, actual income effect, so hourly income effect. And then I have a more general comment or idea maybe for some future work because your main assumption or you say your main assumption of the paper is that the within age group inequality matters and I wonder if the NTA framework or maybe even your data would allow you to compare lifetime income because then you wouldn't have the problem of a timing in employment status or a timing in when um, younger people um, finalize their educational attainment. And then my final question is very related to what Ivan said. So we've also just started doing APC um, models on income changes. And we also saw that the results vary significantly depending on what model we use or what um, method we use. So I was wondering if you tried any other methods and if your results were actually robust. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Sonia. Um, and finally, we are uh, going to hear from Julien. Yeah, hi, everyone. So I thought this was a really nice paper. It's always uh, good to see you. And some of, of my questions were already asked by Haven and Sonia, so I will go on the complementary questions. So my first question is more remark. So you focused on public redistribution, the role of public redistribution on uh, on uh, on disposable income. But uh, so for sure, France is one of the of the main country uh, when we talk about public redistribution. But it would be interesting to to have a look at uh, to have a look at uh, the role of uh, asset income. I don't know what what the quality of your data is about it, but. It could be great to, to, to have a look at, uh, at, at the role of labor income and asset income, especially because of the well-known work of, of Piketty uh, that we know and because of the, the growing role of asset income in, uh, in added value. So it's more and more to the equation. Um, and I, I don't really know the database you are using, but uh, uh, I was wondering if you have some stuff about, about wealth transfers. Uh, and my, my last remark is, is, is pretty precise. So I know that you, you did some APC models for uh, intergenerational inequalities. And here in, your, in this paper, the last, uh, uh, the last uh, graph shows that apparently the generation 1960 is pretty, pretty doing well in comparison with the 1950 generation. However, when we look at NTA age profile, we see that uh, that uh, labor income stagnated uh, up to 40 years old. So it seems that we have less, less uh, uh, intra-core inequalities. Oh, sorry, my cat is on my table. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, uh, so so it, is there is something about I would like to know if we could have a look on, on, on different uh, uh, socioeconomic status, uh, age profile to, to, to try to explain this apparent uh, contradiction. It's not, but that's it. Okay, so that's a lot of questions, and unfortunately, we don't have time for you to answer all of them. Um, but you know, you've got five minutes, so you have the floor. Okay, so thank you all for those uh, nice questions. So, uh, a very quick res response on the APC model. So, of course, we should try um, any methods and uh, to see whether it's robust. But I would say, you know, uh, first, when when you look at raw raw data, you see this hum shape. And basically, I'm using the estimation to confirm this, you know. And since with uh, APC model, you still get, you know, this hum shape, I'm quite satisfied, you know. It's simply, you know, it's, it mimics the raw data. So, of course, uh, we could do a lot of robustness tests and, and, uh, and we have done it. Uh, but uh, but, uh, but uh, the, what is important is to start, you know, with the descriptive statistics. Um, uh, there is a, um, a, 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 um, some question, you know, about uh, um, income change over time and what kind of income we are using and uh, if whether we could uh, uh, 
uh, try to decompose, you know, with, uh, uh, within the various source of income. So, of course, we could do it. Huh? We have very detailed data. When we are using disposable income, there is everything, you know, so uh, labor income, asset income, um, and so on. So, it could be indeed interesting, you know, as a um, you know, as a next step and to see uh, uh, whether it's uh, the composition or not of, uh, of uh, the, 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 the income that creates some inequality. So what is imp very important for us is that um, it, when you, you, you look at generation basically and uh, if you focus on, uh, let's say, income of the various generation, you will see a very strong increase over time, okay? Um, the younger generation are, uh, are, uh, are uh, richer, you know, um, enjoy higher disposable income than the previous one. So it's now important to look at uh, inequality within those generations. Uh, and what do we get is that there is an increase in inequality for the younger generation. Okay, so they, they, they do live in a more unequal um, world, if I may. And this is interesting to obtain, you know, as a result, uh, because when you see over the life cycle, uh, the, the young people are, uh, live in a less unequal world than the middle age. But if you look at the court, uh, from a court perspective, it's not at all the case. And the younger generation, you know, live in a more unequal world. And um, so, so I was asked by even, you know, what would be the policy implication? You know, it's a, I don't know whether um, there is a, a strong policy implication, but uh, it's a way to understand the world and to understand the frustration, you know, of the young in France, you know. And if you use some uh, aggregate data, you would say, no, there is no increase in inequality in France. Uh, we do not understand this, uh, this, uh, this uh, frustration that... Uh, um, that, 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 it, that is expressed by the, the youth. But uh, actually, with those data, we see that there is more and more inequality, you know, among the young cohort. And uh, I think this is very an important consequences of uh, globalization and uh, we should not uh, overlook it. Um, David, do, you, do, do I have still a little bit of time? You have two more minutes, Hippolyte. Okay, that's great. Um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, education, employment, you know your question, uh, Sonia. Um, so we, we do restrict to uh, those who are uh, um, more than 25 years old. So basically, we do not have any more the student, uh, ex except maybe some PhD student, but they say that they do not count. Um, even though it's very important for us as a teacher, but, but, but <laughs> in the data, they do not come that much. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, so, so actually, uh, indeed, uh, the, the profile that you have uh, over your life cycle is that uh, um, there is some initial difference in education, you know, but uh, when you compare, you know, during the first stage of your life, you know, after education, basically the income difference, uh, which are, mostly uh, labor income difference are not so large. And then you move, you know, um, you, you get older and those differences become very striking, especially might be uh, also because there is some, uh, uh, some uh, intergenerational transfer, you know, some, uh, some benefit from, uh, from uh, uh, some increase in their wealth, you know, because of uh, intergenerational transfer. And then, you know, you move uh, uh, further, you know, uh, in, um, on, on, on the life cycle and you become older. And uh, um, let's say that you are on pension and those, uh, the, this pension system is equalizing a lot, you know, the difference uh, um, uh, across individuals and reduce basically the inequality. Um, uh, Julien, uh, so indeed, uh, we do have the asset income. Uh, with uh, the survey we are using, uh, the, uh, the evaluation of asset income is uh, much better than with uh, the previous uh, survey that we were using, but uh, we do not have uh, the, the wealth transfer. Uh, it's, uh, it's the next step. And it's, of course, uh, related to what is done by the, the team of uh, Piketty. 
uh, a, a last question, you know, was about, you know, the definition. Um, so disposable income is uh, basically your income, you know, after tax. And uh, what I'm naming, you know, the gross income is, uh, is basically your income before tax. But I mean, by tax, I mean all kinds of taxes, in, including social, uh, social contribution, which are very large uh, in France. And uh, it was a lot of work in order to recompute, you know, all those social contributions that uh, each category of the population of the labor force has to pay, you know, because uh, the, 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 amount, the amount that should be paid, you know, are different from one category. You know, it's not the same for civil servant and for self-employed, for instance. And we had to recompute all those uh, uh, tax paid by everyone, you know, at the individual level. So it's not like a, when what we did, you know, when when we were computing the um, let's say the average, um, which was a, well, it was a lot of work, but uh, it was not so complicated. Here you have to distinguish, you know, according to the occupation. Okay, thanks very much, Hippolyte. Thank uh, you, David. So now we turn to um, the paper from the, the U.S. and I'm not sure who's going to be presenting. Um, I'm going to start, David, and okay. then Gretchen will take over. Great. So, um, we have been very um, delayed. We've had many uh, problems and distractions and uh, COVID-19 and so on. And so we're very far behind and we just have some early results, but uh, I think there's still some interesting material to discuss. And uh, Gretchen has done much of, most of all really the hard work and that's done excellently, as you will see. And then I've tried to paste a little interpretation on that is unripe. Okay, so here is what we have now. Uh, we have annual results for 2006 to 2018, and then subsequently we will extend these uh, from back to 1981, but we haven't gotten there yet. And then what has taken a lot of uh, effort on Gretchen's part is, um, what just happened here, excuse me. Uh, is this problem of the institutionalized population that she'll be talking about and working out how to include college students, prison inmates, and people in nursing homes. And uh, I think that's a new effort for us in the U.S. anyway. And then, so we'll have basic NTA over this 13-year period. Then we'll have NTA by education of head and by gender. And then we will have distributions at the individual level for a number of variables. And we'll come back to that, but I think, uh, oh, I've already talked about where we want to go. I think I'll just turn it over to Gretchen. So uh, in the early days, many moons ago, some of you may remember, um, a working paper put together uh, by Sankyap and Ron and uh, Nicole and various other people called charting the generational economy. So we're now trying to move into the phase of charting the distributional generational economy. <clears throat> so uh, I guess I should do this. Um, okay, so uh, I'll talk at the end about some of the challenges, why this is a little difficult for me. Um, but so what I'm trying to get to is the ability to show the distribution of every age profile, um, both across some covariates and then just uh, the basic distribution in terms of percentiles uh, at different age groups. So what you're looking at is labor income in the early period, 2006, compared to 2017. Um, and then the black line in the middle is the median and then sort of has shaded bands to show these different quartiles. So there's nothing huge that differs between these two time periods, except you can see um, the increase, sort of the delaying of retirement that mostly comes at these higher income earning um, uh, quantiles at the oldest ages. 
uh, compared to uh, 2006, and that's been a trend uh, in the new millennium. Um, and then here is private consumption. So I don't have overall consumption for some annoying, tedious technical reasons, but um, so here's, uh, this is private consumption, excluding health and excluding education. So this is this big private other category. And um, between uh, 2006 here and 2018, and then this little uh, chart on the bottom left shows uh, the ratio of the interquartile range to the median, just to try and get a summary measure uh, of change. And so you can see that goes up a little bit at pretty much every age um, to 2018, showing that things are, the distribution is widening a little, it's getting a little uh, more unequal. And uh, here is, instead of just age, here is the distribution uh, means at different education of household heads. So this is something that many NTA countries have already done years ago, and the U.S. is finally charging ahead <laughs> with our own efforts here. Um, and so I tried to put just some, another summary measure of change on the bottom uh, to show the ratio of the green line, which is uh, college graduates and greater, versus uh, the blue line on the distributional charts, which is less than high school graduate. Um, but it doesn't look like there's a tremendous amount of patterning between 2006 and 2018. There's a little bit, but nothing huge. Um, and then here, just as another example, private health consumption by the education of household head again. And um, here it does look a little bit like the uh, difference is going down somewhat, um, but that's mainly because sort of the uh, blue line, the lowest education group, is having to pay more. They're sort of having to catch up um, a little bit uh, because everyone's health costs are going up and are going up even uh, more strongly than the highest group or relatively. Um, here is, uh, instead of education of household head, just distribution of self-employment um, income by sex. And I'm sorry I didn't have time to smooth any of these so that they are all choppy and it's hard to see any patterning. Um, but uh, to me, this does look like a little bit of convergence between 2006 and 2018 um, in those ratios down the bottom. And then this uh, is an attempt to take some of these uh, NTA profiles by certain characteristics and get a summary measure. So this uh, each chart here shows on the top line um, the median value of the ratio of college plus compared to less than high school graduates um, for the different age profile. So for the life cycle deficit, it looks like the dispersion is going down a little bit, trending down over time, so it's getting closer to one. Um, labor income that looks over this short period of time to have gone way up and then down. Um, and I think Ron's gonna talk a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, and then consumption again, looks like it's getting a little closer to equality, but then the ranges of these are all quite uh, uh, changing quite a bit. And then on the bottom uh, is this, this same measure, but done um, comparing the male ratio to the female ratio, so that uh, if it goes down, those things are uh, trending generally to greater equality for the first two charts, although the consumption um, line is pretty close um, by gender anyway, so there's not a ton of there, it just zigs around. So those are just a few examples of uh, where we're trying to go. I mean, I sort of envision someday having this cool Tableau dashboard where you can just fiddle with these things uh, to your heart's content and that would help us really sort of see what kinds of trends, especially if we I can get this thing going for a much longer time period, how society has changed uh, in these distributional issues, which certainly in terms of social sciences is the name of the game these days, that you stand up and talk about one measure for a whole population and, uh, and are greeted with a great deal of skepticism. 
The big issues in doing this for us are, as Ron mentioned, the large institutionalized population that consumes a lot of health care, and we need to get that uh, right. So the data on covariates for that population are hard to come by. Um, they're not in, by definition, in household surveys. So you have to have specialized surveys to get them. Um, they need lots of assumptions about what they do. Um, and then as many of the other uh, presenters today discussed, the United States has this two survey problem. We have one main consumer expenditure survey and then another survey that is our main source of uh, income and then uh, tax and government benefits um, data. And so linking those two in order to get the distribution, so you know, so a, a big flow like consumption has pieces from all these different surveys. So I can't get this nice clean quantile measure because I don't have one uh, sample of all the pieces that make up consumption. So then you are in this world of trying to link them or impute them or, um, and, uh, then you have to have those imputations by whatever characteristics um, you want to include. Um, and then trying to get our health care uh, by any covariate. So, I mean, as anybody who's trying to do this sort of micro level stuff knows that um, just looking at the mean covers a whole host of sins. And uh, when we're not going to do that anymore, uh, we have to. Um, make up for those things. So for example, in the United States, my institutionalized 25 year olds, there's a good chunk of them who are in prison and there's a good chunk of them who are in college. So when I don't care about looking within 25 year olds, they kind of cancel each other out. But if I'm looking at high income 25 year olds and low income 25 year olds, I have to get those shares right. And so that's, um, why it takes so darn long. And then little issues, everybody who does NTA has all of these. You just chase around information to get a particular profile um, correct. But uh, I won't bore you with my US stuff. So uh, that's just a flavor of where we are. And then uh, for a little more analysis uh, and thoughtfulness, I will turn it back over to Ron. So what I've done is to take those, well, various kinds of ratios across age that Gretchen showed earlier. For example, the interquartile range divided by the median at each age. Okay, so we have that across the age range. Well, I've looked at ages 25 to 60 which is a sort of well-behaved part of the age distribution. And then I have um, calculated the median of those ratios. So if the median of those ratios is high, that shows a lot of inequality uh, sort of for the whole age distribution in some sense. And if it's low, it shows a, a small level of uh, uh, inequality. And so here is an example. This is looking at just labor income inequality over time. This is before tax in the usual NTA way. And so it's the median of the ratio of the interquartile range divided by the median. And this goes from 2006 to 2018. Well, it's interesting because the red line marks the Great Recession, which hit during 2008, but after the survey on which labor income is based, which I think was the March current population survey. So we have pretty flat uh, level of inequality in labor income, um, sort of summarizing uh, across all the ages, pretty flat. And then comes the start of the Great Recession, and we have this big run-up uh, through 2011, where it peaks out. And you can see this is a substantial 
increase. The scale starts at zero here. It's a substantial increase in inequality. And there's no squaring involved or anything like that in this measure. And then after 2011, you see this very slow decline, but it never gets back to where it started, which would have been around here, somewhere just above 1.4. Uh, so that seems quite interesting to me, and it's nice to be able to relate these changes we see in our microdata and in these distributional measures to uh, macro events. Well, what else do we have here? Okay, now uh, the ratio of labor income uh, for those with a college degree or more to those with less than a high school degree. So uh, Gretchen showed that to the same uh, kind of plot earlier. Uh, here again, we have the Great Recession, and you can see again, that's this quite flat through 2008, then comes the recession and it jumps way up uh, more or less immediately on a, you know, an annual scale. Uh, and after that, I don't know what uh, this flopping around means, but uh, eventually as the unemployment rate begins to drop lower and lower, um, this educational differential in labor income drops well below uh, where it started out. And it seems still to be uh, on the way down as the unemployment rate uh, headed lower and lower. Uh, it was really, um, it was when unemployment dropped to 5.6% in 2014, that's when things really started to go down. Uh, okay, so that's the, the second thing. And the third thing here is that, um, well, I, I think uh, Gretchen may have shown this as well. You see um, the racial ratio of male to female labor income is dropping over this whole period. So you don't see any particular effect, or maybe you see a bit of an acceleration of this decline. Uh, with, the, with the Great Recession, and I think it was uh, male jobs that were hurt more than female jobs during the recession. But on the whole, it's just a long downward trend over those, uh, well, the 12 years. Uh, but of course, at the end of that, it's still about two thirds higher for men. Well, that's where we are, oh, I wanted to add a word of comparison to uh, Ippolit's uh, and, and uh, Baji uh, presentation. Um, uh, there's you know, really no comparison. We're just starting here and they have a very nice finished analysis. Uh, but uh, still there's some things that might be interesting to point out. So our labor income measure that uh, I was just talking about is pre-tax. This seems to me to be closest to their uh, gross income. That is after social contributions, but before other taxes are paid. Um, so they calculate Gini coefficients and decile shares and quartile shares. Uh, and we just have this interquartile range divided by median. They're all very different measures. Um, but, uh, and their dates are different than ours, but all the same. Um, they find incomes become more unequal, more unequal over time, except ages of 50 to 64. We also find increasing inequality. Uh, but uh, we also get a big increase in inequality at ages 50 to 64 by our measure when we look at just those particular ages. Um, they find a hump-shaped inequality for gross income with inequality higher in the middle working ages. We find inequality by our measure uh, very flat from 25 to 50, and then after 50, it rises deeply. Well, 
maybe that difference will disappear if we calculate Gini ratios and do other things that uh, make our analysis more consistent uh, with theirs. But that's as far as uh, we've gotten. I won't uh, uh, talk about plans for further analysis since I already discussed some of that uh, earlier. And I think I will just uh, leave it at that and we'll be very interested to hear any uh, reactions or suggestions or interpretations you have. Okay, thanks, thanks Ron. I think our, our first discussant is Alexia. Uh, you can hear me? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Many thanks. I think it's a fascinating work. And uh, since it's also the first time for me now to have seen the slides, I have only a few comments and I think we can have a more open also discussion round. But let me start from the back. Uh, I think it's extremely interesting, I think, to have this kind of comparison across time because this would have been my first question. You are capturing between 2006 and 2018 the recession, of course, and it would be interesting to understand, I mean, how far the recession had an impact on all these inequalities. Uh, going back, I think, to these last figures, uh, let me just start uh, because of this labor income inequality. I think uh, the similar point was raised before. I think it would be interesting a decomposition effect. Was it due to the fact that there were more people being not in the labor force, being unemployed, or was it more due to the higher wage gaps between different income groups uh, or different age groups? I think to really understand where this inequality changes come from, I think would be interesting. Uh, in terms of educational differences, I think I would have the same comment. I think education, over 10 year time periods or even longer time periods has a different meaning. I think it's the income, uh, sorry, the educational distribution has changed uh, quite a lot, I think. And a higher education nowadays means something else as a higher education 12 years ago. So I think this would be also very important possibly to have relative income or uh, sorry, relative educational groups, uh, something like this. Uh, then the other thing I think it's also interesting, the ratio of male to female labor income, that it really has a continuous decrease, which seems that there is a really kind, either the males were more affected by the recession or the more positive interpretation would be that the females are more now really in the labor market. I think it's again, would have to be discussed. Uh, Generally, I think uh, to the other figures, I have just one remark in terms of everything is now with respect to the age of the household head. I mean, uh, what Gretchen has shown us, all these figures, I think it's very interesting. I'm just wondering, like Bernard has shown today in the first presentation, possibly the age of the household head, I mean, misses a lot of heterogeneity within the household. So. Uh, possibly it would be interesting to look at many of these distributions by life stages instead of just the age. Uh, I'm just like thinking like there could be a uh, household head age 20 and a household head age 40, but they could have very similar families in a sense behind. And on the other hand, I think a 25 year and a 20 year old household head can have very different family compositions. So I think we should think generally whether distributions by age are the best or whether we should also complement it by distributions across household uh, differences. Uh, I think this was basically one of the arguments as well. And uh, Last but not least, I was wondering, I mean, you have shown Gretchen, which is very interesting, and with Bernard have done a paper also for Austria, where we looked at this educational differences in terms of consumption, income, health, transfers, etc. And we always get the question, does it pay off to invest into education in terms of what it costs, because they are starting the labor force, entry ages are later, they possibly have higher pensions at the end or something. So I think a discussion about the life cycle effect of educational investment, the returns to education in terms of transfers, in terms of what they contribute to the system, but also the benefits they get later on. I think it's always an important discussion, I think, when we want to defend that education is really important to have this overall, I think, life cycle perspective. And maybe I'll end here and leave also, uh, I think, the discussion to the others and uh, to the general audience. 
but I think it's fascinating and it's great work. Thanks, Alexia. So um, I'll be very pleased to welcome James um, from Australia. Oh, hello. Well, yeah, firstly, I'd like to thank you for having the meeting at a very sensible time in my time zone. <laughs> but uh, I really only have uh, one comment. Not, really. that, that doesn't hold for everyone, James. <laughs> oh, I know. I, know. <laughs> uh, I only have a very small comment, really, which I, I do think it's fascinating, the uh, interplay between age and education in uh, the impact of recessions and uh, how people recover. So, uh, you know, as we know, education is increasing over time so that the younger populations have higher levels of education than older populations. But then again, uh, in recessions, it's usually younger workers who are worse uh, hit uh, than older workers on the, the uh, uh, general principle of, you know, the, the first people hired are the first people to be um, fired. So it's interesting to, uh, I mean, it's interesting, to me, it would be fascinating to, uh, to disentangle the effects of uh, these in recessions where you might think that, uh, you know, older, uh, younger workers would be uh, worst uh, affected because they are younger, but also since, you know, there are educational effects to who is affected by recessions in terms of whether it's the uh, lowly educated or the highly educated. So there's a lot of interesting uh, interactions there, which I think, uh, yeah, would be uh, are very inter interesting to explore. So that's all I really have in terms of comments. Okay, thanks very much. And our final discussion for this uh, session is, is Sia from Barcelona. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, good. Well, just a short comment because um, there have been already some. Well, I think it's extremely interesting this, this issue of inequality that we are starting to face, to, to, to try to analyze. Um, probably there is a lot of work to do to, to try to visit from the in evolution of inequality in the literature, in the economic literature, to try to disentangle the age component, which is also affected by the age, component, age shape of transfers, which are unequally protecting, for example, the children and the elderly. So I think this is a lot of a, a, a very interesting area we, can, we have to explore. I mean, we, we started, but there is a lot to do. And of course, we need an, a longitudinal perspective for that, that we are starting also to build. So. And then another issue that no one has tackled for the moment, I think it's also interesting to, to try to, at some point we will have to see how significant our, our age profiles, we, we build age profiles and we compare it across countries and, and across years. And we need to do a job that is checking the, the, how significant they are. And I, some months ago I asked Gretchen and it seems that only Ivan tried to do that at least at the aggregate level, he, I think Ivan is here, um, he estimated the significance of the aggregates by region and, and poverty level, a measure of poverty level. So I think this is also something that we have to, to approach at some point. And basically that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I see we're only running five minutes late. So I don't know, Ron, do you think there's time for a few questions, a few general questions? Or I think if anyone has any, any uh, questions, I think we can probably take one or two and then a break. No? Okay, so, um, so we recon. Does James Sefton have one? Sorry, is, is there James? Yeah, yeah, it's just a very quick one to about the general inequality measures that people have used. So Hippolyte used the decile ratio and also the Gini coefficient. And if I, I am I'm not 100 percent sure, but from well, what I understood from this end looking at the slides, the results were quite different depending on which measure you used. And would one way of interpreting or trying to understand the difference between those two measures? be the fact that it's all in the, all the rise in inequality is happening in the tails in the top 1% rather 
would that drive the difference between what you were seeing in the decile and the Gini numbers? So that was the question, yeah. David, if I may. Uh, I, I, I feel that it's, uh, so it's indeed it's important that we should compute all the possible ratio and have those kind of uh, discussion. But uh, so, so for me, what is important is, have to, is to have uh, at least a measure that do not depend on the mean. Um, so like, uh, like any uh, decile ratio of, or Gini or whatever, because uh, I feel that we do not want to rescale our data. Okay, so we did it for aggregate, you know, and it's fine because we could rescale, you know, an aggregate value, but for individual data, it's very complicated. Um, if I might just, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, what we, what uh, Gretchen and I were looking at, that measure is insensitive to anything outside the middle two quartiles. Uh, so uh, yes, the tails could be very different and uh, it's going to show up in the genie and other things. So, yeah. Okay, so sang -Yop has a question. Just comment, I mean, there is a, a paper by actually Narayana wrote a paper, you know, this is an issue for more developing countries. So they are more interested in poverty lines. So actually based on NTA data, they calculate both the poverty um, you know, line, poverty rate and Gini. The shape are totally different. If we use a Gini in India, for example, it's like hump shaped by AG. But if you use poverty, uh, poverty, it's just a downward sloping monotonically. So depending on uh, one measure you use, especially in developing country, it's totally different. So, and especially you know, for developing country, as I mentioned, the, the poverty line, how many people are under you know, below poverty line is much more important than just Gini coefficient. Just comment. Okay, I think there's time for one last question and then we'll uh, end the session. Anyone? Well, yes, uh, I just have a comment on the on Ron's work. I think it's very interesting that uh, they are incorporating the institutionalized population. Maybe not important for other countries, for, for the US, like it's, I think it's, important because a lot of minority populations are in, in jail and and then the, it's important to capture that that effect and and the other comment is about migration like the mexican migration in the us has has been declined substantially in the last 10 years but but there is a new program like work uh, i think they call it a, a temporal working uh, program something like that so a lot of Mexican workers travel to the U.S., stay for some time, and then just come back. They don't have social security. They pay taxes, uh, and of course, they generate labor income, and they send uh, they, they send uh, remittances back. So I, I don't know how significant is that for for the U.S., but Mexico, for, maybe for the Mexican NTA, it's, it's just my comment. Okay, any final, final, final questions? No? Okay, well, thank, thank you very much. Um, I think, I guess we are running a little bit late, but I'll take a, a 15 minute recess and, and reconvene just before 2 a.m. Eastern time. <laughs> <laughs> For you very intrepid folks. <laughs> uh, great, so we'll see you, see you shortly. Bye-bye. See, see you in a bit.